You have no rival, you stand alone. The heavens worship before your throne. There is no one like you. Your kingdom reigns, yours is the highest of every name, there is no one like you, and Almighty, we're standing in the presence of your majesty. the King of Kings, Almighty. Our God eternal, the great I am, the praise of angels will never end. like fire, face like the sun, a voice like thunder, who was and is and is to come, yeah. Almighty, we're standing in the presence of your majesty. You're the King of Kings, Almighty. And I see the Holy One, high and exalted. I hide my eyes and I tremble before Him. And I tremble before Him.
your great grace, oh such grace. From the creation to the cross, there from the cross into eternity, your grace finds me. Yes, your
from the depths of your heart. I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of you. No. And I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of you. Oh no. And I'm not ashamed. Do you realize that's what we're going to do? Because God, you alone, you alone deserve all the glory. So this morning, church, I want you to get it down deep in your soul. I want you to picture yourself standing in front of Almighty God, in front of Jesus, our redemption, the one who we owe everything. So God, we, God, we love you. God, we will worship you forever. I think a lot of you know this, but some of you probably don't know, that Carolyn was very instrumental in helping to get our children's ministry really flowing big time, okay? We've always had a children's ministry, and we've, we've always ministered to children and made that a priority, 
but Carolyn had this special gift about her where she, uh, after a vacation Bible school several years ago, um, you know, we run the bus during vacation Bible school and a whole bunch of kids started coming. She said, after vacation Bible school is over, she says, I don't want, let's, uh, let's continue to pick up the kids every Wednesday and every Sunday. So, so she, she decided to do that. She kind of had to that up until she had to move to the other side of Missouri. But, but she got that going. And, and the reason that big yellow bus sits out there is because we got to the point where we needed that, okay? And uh, anyway, that's just one small evidence. But I want you to know, she's got a special place in her heart for children, okay? And so I've asked her to stay up here, and I would like to ask her, if she would, to pray over our children and bless them like Jesus did back when he walked the earth, okay? He blessed the children. He called the children to come to him, and he blessed them. So, Carolyn, would you have our prayer? Father, I just love you so, and I, you, I praise you, Lord. I, I'm looking at these children because I know I can pray with my eyes open. And Father, I just thank, thank you, you for each and every one of them, for these wonderful, thank wonderful you, children. Thank you, Jesus. And I ask that your Holy Spirit flow through each one of them as they hear about you from the teachers that are in this, this church family. Yes, Father. I just thank ask you, Lord, that thank your love for them you, go to their homes, thank Lord, you, that some of them may not have thank the you, kind of love that thank all you, of them have. And I just ask you that that love go to each and every one of them, <laughs> including my little uh, chip off the old block granddaughter there. And, uh, I just love you, Lord, and I know they love you, and I know that they are called for special things. And they're going to be facing a lot of things as they grow up. Yes. But your Holy Spirit is going to be with them. And it's because of what they're learning today in their spirit to yes, be Lord Jesus. as they grow. Yes. We praise you, Lord, because you're such a mighty, mighty God. Yes. And that you love these children so That's much. Right. That's right. And bring them here so Thank that they Jesus. can hear about you and have that wonderful love proclaimed yes. to them. Yes. That they can proclaim it to the world. That's right. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you. You can go downstairs now, okay? There's a lot of people who are called to the ministry uh, that may not accept that call. Yeah, I'm talking about you. Some of you out there may be, feel called to ministry, but you haven't responded to that call yet because you think there's somebody else that's better. Maybe there's somebody else that's more equipped or more gifted or... Or you're waiting for a certain thing to happen and, you know, the lightning bolt out of the sky, you know, to come and hit you. And, um, uh, but, and, and, but God's knocking on your heart's door. So just, just, just pray about your call, your, the gifting that's in you. I'm not saying everybody is called to be ordained like we did just now in that particular fashion. But we are all called to ministry. We're all called to reach out in, in the love of Jesus. But then God uh, extends that call uh, to, to go deeper a lot of times, uh, and uh, he may have you uh, uh, selected and, and chosen to, to go that extra, uh, as Carolyn has done and some of us have done, and, uh, and become uh, ordained and answer that call. I tell you what, God is good. And uh, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 24. Carolyn stole some of my message. <laughs> yeah, the Holy Spirit is in charge and uh, is flowing, and and uh, she hit on a major, major point that I want to make today. So uh, she she kind of gave the appetizer, and I'll try to give the, the the main course here in some way, shape, or form. Matthew chapter 24. We're talking about marching orders for the end times. Uh, Carol also made reference to the times in which we live. We do live in very tough times. We're living in very challenging times. I can't remember in my lifetime how things have turned so much. Um, and I'm just going to say it this way. I don't know any other way to say it. Things have turned so much against Christians in the last year, two years, five years. Okay, And uh, things have just kind of turned in general uh, 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 against against those who have genuine faith in Jesus Christ. Can I put it that way? Genuine faith in Jesus Christ. We are um, uh, being ostracized, we're being ridiculed, we're being made fun of, we're being ignored, we're being persecuted, those who have faith in Christ. So that's kind of the times in which we live. This is not an occasion to get discouraged. This is not an occasion to give up. It's not an occasion to get 
mad and angry and all those kind of things. It's an occasion to shine. Shine brighter than we've ever shown before. And in order to do that, we've got to listen to the marching orders from our commander-in-chief. God has called us into an army. He's called us into a family. Family first. But he's also called us into an army. You're not only a, 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 a child of God, those of us who have received Christ, but we're also a soldier of the Spirit, a soldier of God. And we're going to look at that soldier part because we are in the end times. Um, uh, so look at Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 3. It says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? As we read down through this, I want you to, to, to kind of plug in uh, the parallels that we're seeing today here in America. It says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated. Oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Okay. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Carolyn, deception. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, a kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. There's a deception thing a second time. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, not some, but the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And verse 14 concludes this passage by saying, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Comparing this scripture with what's going on in our world today, we're certainly in the end times. Verse 13 says, But he who stands firm to the end or endures to the end will be saved. And the question today is, what does it take to stand firm? If that's, the, if that's the order of the day, if that's what the commander-in-chief is telling us to do, then we better find out what it takes and what that means to stand firm to the end. What are the scriptural keys to endurance? There are some keys I'm going to share with you today. This is not the end-all list. This is some major things. There's some major things that we're, we've read about in the passage today. First of all, guard against being deceived. <laughs> First point: guard against being deceived. The only way to keep from being deceived is to know the truth. This isn't complicated stuff here. If you if you wanna if you wanna keep on the right path and you keep your mind flowing in the right direction and you and you wanna. Uh, keep going the way God wants you to, then you got to know the truth. Because there's deception, which is nothing but lying, and then there's the truth. There's only two, two ways to look at things, the truthful way or the deceptive lying way. And, and the, we're in a world where deception is rampant. It's rampant. If you are familiar with and are convinced of the truth, you will recognize deception. There are two forms of truth, or I should say two resources for truth. The living truth, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the way, the way, and the life. So he called himself, declared himself to be the truth. And then it also says, thy word is truth. The word is truth. He is the living word, and this is the written word. The word is truth. That's why we, we, we say and say and uh, confirm and declare and exhort and all those kind of things. Know the word of God. 
That will, that will solve all the problems right there. Just knowing the truth. Doesn't mean we won't have issues. Doesn't mean we won't have challenges and all that. But when it comes, when push comes to shove, you'll know what the truth is. And then you will stand truth. Stand truthful. It's God's word. In praying for his disciples, Jesus asked the Father to sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, as he prayed in John 17, 17. So we have to continue to ask ourselves, do I know the word? Am I familiar with the word? Is it a book that I just look at a dist- from a distance and say, it's too hard for me to understand. I tried it a few times back when I was younger, and it just got too confusing for me. So I'm not going to waste my time anymore. I'll let uh, the preacher just preach it to me, and I'll come and listen. Well, I take that as a compliment, but it's a mistake. If I'm the only source or any preacher or any teacher or anybody else outside of you, it becomes your source for getting the word of God, then, then that's not what God has called you to do. He has called us to be students of the word in and of ourselves. And yes, God has gifted preachers and teachers and, and all those that help to explain and exhort you know, the word of God like I'm doing today. It's, that's scriptural, but... The Bible is very clear. We are to study to show ourselves approved. Study to show ourselves approved. Don't rely upon the preacher's study to show yourself approved. You show yourself approved by studying the Word of God. It has to be your daily handbook for these marching orders that, that, is, that, 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 the, that the Lord has given to us in these last days. Okay? And if it isn't in the Word, don't believe it. If it's not in the Word, don't believe it. Paul reminds us to put on the belt of truth. In Ephesians 6, put on the belt of truth. You know what a belt does? Holds our fat in. No, I'm joking. (laughs) A belt holds everything together. A belt holds everything together. We had a gentleman down in, I was pastoring a church down in Texas Bless his heart. Bless his pants. <laughs> One day it was a snowy day and he wore these coveralls. I, I praise God there wasn't many people at church that day. It was snowy down in Texas. When, when Even there's a forecast of snow, people just stay in. Well, we had a few people that morning and, and, uh, and he was one of the ones to stand up. Um, uh, Archie. To, 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 no, Ar- yeah, Archie. To stand up, he, he helped take up the offering, you know. So I called for the ushers to come forward, and I turned around to get the offering plates. And I turned around, hand the offering plates, took up the offering. And Pam, at the end of the service, I go back to the back door to, to greet people as they're leaving. And she said, could you believe what happened? I said, what are you talking about? She said, Archie. Said, what about Archie? I said, his pants fell onto his knees. <laughs> So I'm going to give him a new pair of pants, and he didn't have suspenders on. He always wore suspenders or the, or the, the coveralls, you know, with the things over the shoulders and all that. And that day, he didn't, he didn't have the, the suspenders, and they gave him a new pair of pants, and they fell down to his knees, and he was so embarrassed. And, and uh, I had to go visit him that next week because uh, he was of the nature where he, he was so embarrassed. He said, tell all the ladies that, that to forgive me. Uh, and, and my goodness, so he wasn't going to come back to church, but I went to talk to him and say, you know what, <laughs> it could happen to anybody, I'm thinking. <laughs> well, it could. Only time I've seen it happen, but I guess it could happen to anybody. But I, I convinced him to come back to church, and, you know, because, uh, you know, we, we loved him and all that kind of stuff. But, but so a belt's pretty important, right? A belt's pretty important, and, and for people built like me, if I don't have a belt, it's, it's, it's all over about the shouting and the embarrassment. So I, 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 the belt holds everything together, helps keep things where they should be. The belt of truth is the word of God. And that, that, that belt needs to be put around us, and it needs to be firm. It needs to be a part of us every single day. It needs to be a part of us. So it holds everything together. That's key number one. Key number two, don't give in to fear. Do you know God says many times, many places from Genesis to Revelation, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, do not fear, do not fear, do not be afraid, do not fear. It goes over and over and over again. 
And, uh, and, and I don't know how many times it shows up. I used to know that number at one point, but it's a lot. It's a lot. The enemies of God would love to make you afraid. How do you keep from being afraid? How do you, how do, you do that? It, it, we do it by being convinced of three things. Look at verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. And, then, and the, not be alarmed, is, it goes beyond just the wars and rumors of wars thing. It's this whole atmosphere that's being created now in our, in our world. Do not be afraid. So how, do you, how, how can you be convinced of, 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 of the word of God and not be afraid, afraid? There are three things. First of all, be convinced of your right standing with God. Know who you are. Where you stand in the name of Jesus Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's a rhetorical question that Paul was asking. And he wasn't asking because he didn't know the answer. He said, who can, if God is for us, who can be against us? And he was, he was really shouting at the top of his lungs, if God's for us... You're the winner. You come out on top every time because he's for us. He's not against us. And then secondly, be convinced God has everything under control according to his word. God is aware of what's going on. He wants us to pray about things. He knows things are going haywire. Guess what? He's got a plan. He's got a plan. He doesn't make bad things happen, but he takes those things and he works it so it fulfills his plan. Just like in the Old Testament. If you think that's strange, look in the Old Testament where he even takes his own enemies and uses them to accomplish his purposes. Guess what? God can do that. God can do that. He is in control. He knows how to work these things. But just rest assured, as well as I'm saying that, rest assured that uh, as time goes on, it's not going to be that way forever. God is not going to let his enemies rule forever. There's coming a time when everything will change according to the plan of God. And then thirdly, be convinced that these bad events are leading to a good end. What do you mean, Brian? (laughs) Well, like the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. All right? These things must happen. It says, these things must happen. Verse 8, all these things are the beginnings of birth pains and sorrows. Those who have had babies recently, you know what that's all about. Birth pains are painful. I am glad I'm a guy. I never want to be a woman. You're probably glad of that. Not bad, my wife is. But I want you to know that that birth does involve pain. But that pain doesn't last forever. It seems like it at the moment, like it'll never end. I'm sure. So I've heard. But the birth pains are for a good end. And that's the baby, that new life that you get to hold and how quickly the mother forgets about that pain once she's holding that baby in her arms. And, and see, that's, that's what's happening in, in the day and times in which we live. There are birth pains. The signs of the times should cause a certain excitement. Come on. It should cause a certain excitement to build in God's children because birth pains mean something is about to break forth. Something's about to break forth, and we should be excited about that. Excited about that. Not in a perverted kind of a way, you know, where we're masochists. I'm just talking about there's something about to happen because the world's going haywire. So something's going to happen here, and it's going to be good. Key three, keep faithful in your witness. Keep faithful in your witness. I like the... uh, story about there was once a college student who was struggling in many areas of his life and he spent a great deal of his time feeling angry and frustrated and and one time when he he could stand it no longer he went to the dim seldom used chapel on the college campus he paced up and down the aisle slapping the back of every pew 
And he yelled, he cried, and he raged at God. God, you created the world. What could you possibly have been thinking? Look at the problems people face. Look at the pain, suffering, and hunger. Look at the neglect, the waste, the abuse. Everywhere I look, I see messed up people, hurting people, lonely people. The young man ranted and ranted and raved and went on and on and on in that empty chapel. Finally exhausted, he sat down on the front pew, looked hopelessly at the cross. Its tarnished and dust, dusted, uh, dusty surface reflected the sunlight filtering in through the stained glass windows. It's all such a mess. This world you created is nothing but a terrible mess. Why, even I could make a better world than this one. As he sat there, he felt God saying, that's exactly what I want you to do. Don't stop being a witness. Don't stop being a witness. We're to rise up even stronger. When the winds start blowing, you stay in stronger. When things get darker, you shine brighter. When things get bland, you get salty. He's called to be salt and light. See, we can't use the world's condition as an excuse for living a, a, a non active life when it comes to the things of God. He's called us to do it in spite, maybe even because of the bad things going on in the world. He needs us. He needs us to be his witnesses. Keep faithful in your witness. Don't slack off now, whatever you do. We must do what God has commanded us to do in saving the lost and discipling the saved. Yes, get them saved, but we got to make disciples. That's the great commission we're to do that. Amidst the fear, we can offer peace. In the middle of deception and confusion, we can offer absolute truth. There are absolutes. There are people out there who say, there's no absolutes. Truth is what you make it out to be. It's what you believe it to be. I think there's a word in the Bible that describes that. It's called hogwash. It's in there somewhere. There is absolute truth. The God is an absolute God, and he has absolute truth, and he never changes his mind. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. He is the real deal. He's been the real deal since before you and I or any human being come, come upon the face of the, the universe. He's not going to change now. He is the same yesterday, today, Forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I, the Lord, do not change. In the middle of deception and confusion, we can offer absolute truth. In an atmosphere of hopelessness and despair, we can offer hope and encouragement. With spiritual complacency and emptiness all around, we can offer a full and exciting life through a living God who will never let us down. In a society where so many are in bondage, we can offer freedom. At least 60% of people living in and around Papa Bluff have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Do you think it might be time they're told? Maybe it's time. I'll declare it is. It is time. Key number four, and we'll close with this. Stay keenly aware by being a person of prayer. Stay keenly aware by being a person of prayer. I know every time the subject of prayer comes up, we kind of go, oh, yeah, I know how to pray. Really? Okay. What is God talking about here, being a person of prayer? We are to pray about everything. We are to pray about everything. I have found out over the years that I, I thought I was a person of prayer, but I found out as I looked at that, I prayed, didn't pray much, you know. Well, I prayed at times of crisis. I prayed over my cornflakes. I prayed over, you know, uh, you know, a lot of little things. Prayed over the kids when I went to school. But when God's talking about being a person of prayer, pray always. That's to pray about everything. The Living Bible says pray about everything. Thanking God for the answers. So we'll be prayer. There's no little things with God. 
And one of the keys that, that, that uh, I've discovered, Pam and I have discovered over the years, when, when a prayer request comes up, pray now. Now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Oh, I'll pray for you. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Good intentions. Pray right then, then you, because because the, because then you won't have to forget. Okay, you pray right then. I do that. I, not that I forget much. <laughs> I won't go into all my stories, but anyway, uh, I have a very I have good memories. It's real short, and I I pr- I pray right then because I probably will forget. I'm just being honest with who I am and and uh, all the stuff goes on and around me and in my head, and I just need to pray then and and so so we've learned to do that now you may think well it's kind of awkward at times so <laughs> you know i'd rather be awkward then and not pray and miss something god not wanting us to pray and he wants to work but sometimes he just chooses to wait upon our prayers and if you wait upon my prayer and i don't pray guess what doesn't happen you know so anyway I, it, 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 he works in many many ways luke chapter 21 Luke chapter 21, changing things just a little bit here, it talks about being a person of prayer. Um, Prayer is something we can all do. It's not just left to those that have had a (laughs) seminary degree. Sometimes uh, I've I've often met people who can pray a whole lot better than those who have a seminary degree because they get down to the heart of the matter real quick and God understands what they're trying to say. Luke chapter 21 Starting at verses, uh, uh, we'll read 34 through 36. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who live in the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you, will, that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Verse 34, be careful or your hearts will, not might be, but will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Prayer is the antidote to that disease. Prayer is the antidote to not getting weighed down with the anxiety of life. Not that any of us in here ever experienced that. But prayer is the key there. Constant prayer. Prayer about everything. When you're driving down that road, you can pray. You don't have to close your eyes. I don't recommend closing your eyes if you're driving. You can pray in the shower. Pray in the bathroom. Straight from the throne. You can pray. Sorry. I just kind of slipped out. You can pray while you're mowing the lawn. And some of us can pray while we're at work. Now, depending on what you do, we don't want to take your concentration on something that's that's... That would uh, get you in trouble or would be dangerous. But a lot of times we got those moments or those periods of time while we work, we can be praying, you know. And we're not talking about big fancy, you know, King James prayers. We're talking about just staying in touch with God. He's your power source. Staying plugged in to that power. It's a, it's a constant thing. And if you can't think of anything to pray for, just just start praising Him. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I praise you. Thank you for being so good, so big. So powerful, so loving. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, that can be a whole prayer. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that can be a whole prayer right there. The only way we can be worthy of being counted as one of the faithful warriors in God's army is to keep in touch with and obedient to our commander in chief. Several years ago, do you remember the big brownout that happened up in the, several years ago now, up in the northeast, New York City and, and several of those states around there? And still fresh in the memory is that that huge power failure that involved uh, a lot of those people. This is back in 1965. Some of you weren't alive at that point. But at at 5.18 p.m., New York City went black as well as much of the entire state. The area affected covered some 80,000 square miles and took in most of seven U.S. states and most of Canada's province of Ontario. That's all my neck of the woods where I was raised. Whether it was a generator feeding power at the wrong frequency or a switch thrown in error by some utility company employee, it was hard to determine. 
But the millions of people living in New York and the surrounding area quickly determined that they were without electricity. The lights were out, the power was out, and many were stuck for the night in subway train stations, elevators, and tunnels under the East River. The blackout left some 200 airplanes in the air above New York's Kennedy International Airport. They had to be rerouted to airports in other states where runway lights were still burning. Overall, loss in business due to the blackout, which lasted in some areas up to 13 hours, was estimated at $100 million. A tire company, for example, lost $50,000 worth of tires when power failed during a critical curing process. A car manufacturer had to throw away 50 engine blocks because high-speed drills froze while boring piston holes. Bakeries in New York alone reported a loss of 300,000 loaves of bread, which were spoiled when the power went off. All in all, modern civilization, as Americans and Canadians knew it, on that November night, it came to a screeching halt because the power supply in which they were dependent had been cut off. Don't let your power supply be cut off. Prayer is the power supply. It's our connector to the power of the universe, to the Holy Spirit, to God Almighty, to Jesus Christ who brings us life. And that power keeps us connected. The power that we need to live by is critical to live successfully. And we need not let it burn out. So here's the one, let's look at it this way. The only way to keep to, to be worthy of being counted as one of the faithful warriors, remember, he who endures to the end shall be saved. So who's our commander in chief? Who is he? Who's our commander in chief? I'll tell you this. He is the one out front riding on that white horse, leading us to victory. And prayer keeps our heart right, our spirit strong, our attitude straight, keeps us discerning the times, gives us strength for the fight, makes us aware of the enemy's strategies, steers us clear of distractions and pitfalls. Prayer sets us free from needless burdens, yet gives us a burden for the lost. Prayer helps us stand up for what's right and stand against what's wrong. And prayer prevents us from getting caught up with the temporary while keeping us focused on the eternal. And that's just a partial list of what prayer does. In a war... Communication is critical and often the deciding factor between victory and defeat. Or in our high-tech world, nothing even comes close to the power of prayer. And you just can't get more high-tech than that. Please stand with me. I'm going to call the prayer team to come forward at this time to join me up at the front. Because we're going to invite you to come for prayer. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's been saying to you. But I encourage you to respond to that voice that you're hearing. For that impulse that you're feeling. For those thoughts that have been going through your head. Or you connected with something during the message. The, the, the power of the word of God. God is telling you something. Please respond to that. Especially if you're here today. And you don't know Christ as your personal savior. If you don't have a personal connection, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're lost. The Bible defines you as lost. The Bible says that those without Christ are on their way to hell. We don't want that. God doesn't want that. You know what the heart of God is? He says, I would that none should perish. I would that none should perish. He provided a way out of our mess through Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you don't know about that relationship or if you're in doubt of any kind or if you've walked away from Jesus, it's time to walk back. It's time to get in right relationship with Jesus. I encourage you to come down front and pray. If you don't know Jesus, any of our prayer team will help lead you to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through faith by grace. And there's, there's other needs that you have. We'll pray about any need that you have. Let's utilize that power of prayer that we've been talking about. You come in Jesus' name.